All right. Let's uh, <laughs> pick up here where we left off. Um, are there any questions? Maybe I should just ask if there's any questions about anything we've just gone over or anything else from the reading really up through uh, section, you know, let's say about 20 or so. <coughs> Yeah. I guess it's just kind of confusing with the whole, like how you said, how, we, how we, in the beginning he was talking about how they're, that they're the most simple of things because there is nothing simpler. And then <laughs> it went into, oh yeah, but they can be changed and this and I don't so know, it's kind of. One concern might be how can they be simple and yet it seems like actually pretty complex kind of things. Right. Um, Simple in the sense that they can't be broken down or divided or taken apart. Okay. And once again, this is like you as what you are cannot be changed in any way. If you think, well, I could still be me if I didn't have, you know, that dream last night. Life is going to say no because that would require breaking up something that can't be broken up. That's a, 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 that's a part of who you are in a way that you can't divide that out or break it up. Mm -hmm. So are we monads? Like the are humans monads basically? There's made up. Yeah. Your soul is one rational monad. And that's what you essentially are, according to Leibniz, is your soul. And your body is composed of an infinite number of monads. And that's not really who you are, but you have a body. And so there's like one monad that takes principle over the rest of them when it comes to a human? In a way, but once again, the, <clears throat> the two don't interact with one another. Right. Just such that your mind has these ideas like hand go up, and it's not that your mind causes the hand to go up, it's that it was a pre-timed event so that when you have the thought, that all these other monads do what they're supposed to do to raise the, the hand up. Yeah? On perception, the whole, um, the, I guess, windmill thing? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, let's... I can't that same reasoning be used for like other things, like you could like doubt like a computer program, for example. Like that's because let's say you have a computer mm -hmm. program, right? You you can't ever if you look at like the hard drive, you can't ever find the program. You only find parts of the program, the yeah. the circuitry. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. So how does this this sense. the argument might prove too much is one of the concerns, yeah. right? That if you can do this for consciousness in this way, well, we could do the same with a computer. You can take a tour of all the circuits, the hard drive. You're never going to find that picture of, yeah. you know, the, the pink elephant that you've saved on the hard drive. So where is that? Um, that might be a similar kind of concern here. Um, I don't have much to say besides <laughs> that's probably a fair criticism. Right. Yeah. It comes like moving something or moving a part of your body, does that just, I feel like it completely cancels out like maybe like muscles or like motion, like so you're saying you don't use your muscles at all or there's just bananas floating around <laughs> connected to my hand? <laughs> In a way, yeah. I mean, it once again gives the appearance, of course, as if everything works the way that you thought it did before you read Leibniz. Um, but in reality, things, on his view, couldn't be caught. They can't causally influence one another. So God had to make it this way. So if the banana is going to move and I decide not to move it, it doesn't move anyway. The way that, it, in principle, it could be the case. That would be decided, though, that you yeah. decided not to move it. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that's right. So oh, that's annoying. If there wasn't a God behind all of this organizing it, it could have been the case that you say you decide not to move a banana, but the monads that make up the banana decide to move. But since God's ordered it so it doesn't do crazy things like that, that never happens. It's really important to keep in mind that Leibniz was a, a certifiable genius beyond any anything you've any person you've ever met. We would not be taking this seriously if he did not write this and it wasn't obvious that, that he was a genius beyond comparison. Um, remember, the guy invented calculus. Um, that's part of why we take the time to figure this stuff out, because clearly a genius had something in there, and if we're not getting it, the fault might be on our side, not on his, is what we tend to think. So, 
And there is a sense, when we get to the very end of this, there is something about this that actually isn't so crazy. I know it seems crazy at times, and I want to bring that out because it helps you understand the philosophy. You don't, if, you're not, if you're reading this and you say, oh, that's just common sense to me, you probably don't understand it. Like, this really is kind of weird. And it's important to get the weirdness of it first. But at the end of this, like I said, maybe it's not so weird if, if I can explain that when it's all said and done. Any other questions? Anything about the text? I know a lot of you spent a lot of time trying to understand this, so if you had questions, I want to make sure that I give you the opportunity to ask them or to address them. So, um, anything I can do to help you with that before moving along? Mm -hmm. How exactly is his ontological argument different from the ones that we previously learned? Like so that's coming up next, right. so we'll get to that. Okay. There, there is something I think a little different about this one. Some people, well there's a whole lot of scholarship on this. You could write a paper on how his argument is different from Descartes and Anselm's, but we're getting to that. To, before we do that, we need to talk about the two great principles. Um, anybody remember from your notes, or if you want to look in these sections, what, they, what the two great principles are? Yeah, go for it. <coughs> um, that of, co of contradiction and that of uh, sufficient reason. So we've got the principle of contradiction and the principle of sufficient reason. The principle of contradiction says um, that which involves a contradiction must be false. Basic principle of logic. It's also important to remember Leibniz was a logician. So he thinks logic can achieve a lot. The other, th the other principle is what he calls the principle of sufficient reason. That all true things have a sufficient reason for their being true. In other words, things, there's not randomness, there's not, there's nothing, something can't be true without a reason for why it's true. Now, he parallels these two principles with two different kinds of truth. He calls a tr one, one cl class truths of reason, and the other class truths of fact. Truths of reason are what we call necessary truths. They're the kinds of things you can't even conceive their, imp uh, their impossibility. You can't imagine them being false. Um, truths of fact are contingent, meaning they're not necessary, that they, you can imagine their falsehood, but um, the way that you figure out, so the way you figure out what truths of reason are, are is using the principle of contradiction. If you, if you can imagine, if you cannot imagine something happening, something being the case, then it must be true. So here's a necessary truth. Here's a truth of reason. All red things are colored things. There is no way that you could imagine something that being red and it not being colored. If it's red, it's got to be colored. All red things are colored things. So, since you know that things that involve contradictions must be false, <coughs> and the only way that something <coughs> the only way that something could be red and not be colored is if it was a contradiction, it must be true then that all red things are colored things. Would this kind of go back to the Descartes um, absolute truth with uh, truths of reason? Like things that you cannot perceive to be false? Yeah, I think that this would be very, this is very much in line with the kinds of things Descartes had in mind, clear and distinct ideas. Things that when you understand them in a certain way, you see that they have to be true. Another when it comes to truths of fact, though, things that you can imagine the opposite being false, the possibility of them being, being true, um, you have to figure that out using the principle of sufficient reason. So like today, you know, I wore a blue sweater. But you could imagine that I wore, you know, a yellow sweater or a pink sweater or that I wore no sweater at all. So this is a contingent proof truth, that I'm wearing a blue sweater. That truth requires some sufficient reason for why it's this way rather than some other way. And it might just be, in this case, something as simple as, I don't know, I prefer wearing a blue sweater as opposed to not to. 
But everything has a sufficient reason. Why is Marywood located in Scranton, Pennsylvania? It could have been located somewhere else. There's got to be some sufficient reason for why it's here rather than somewhere else. <clears throat> why are you sitting in the chair you're sitting in as opposed to some other chair in this classroom? Well, there's got to be a sufficient reason for that. So, <clears throat> um, since these are the, the entirety of the different kinds of truths that could exist, um, the two principles neatly map onto this. So by using these two principles, essentially, Leibniz thinks we can know everything. At least everything that's knowable to us. Questions about this distinction or the principles themselves? So, both of these principles essentially can be used by Leibniz thinks to prove the existence of God. So first is the principle of sufficient reason. And here is roughly how the argument goes. You can look at those sections more closely if you'd like. Um, the first claim is that the universe as a whole entity exists contingently. That means you can imagine that the universe does not exist or that a different universe exists. There's nothing about our universe that indicates that it had to exist this way. For that reason, our universe is a contingent entity. But, as we saw, all contingent truths require some sufficient reason. Therefore, we have to conclude there must be a non-contingent explanation, another way to put that, a necessary explanation, for the existence of the universe that is outside, that is not the same as the universe itself. Well, what kinds of things are necessary and exist outside of the universe? There's only one kind of thing, Leibniz thinks, and that would be God. So the universe must have... The, the fact that the universe as a whole is a contingent entity, and you have to have a sufficient reason for it, and you cannot come up with a reason that, that is within the universe itself, you have to infer, it has to be the case, that there is a God. Otherwise, you would have a contingent truth with no explanation, no sufficient reason. This is, this is usually thought of as one form of a cosmological argument for the existence of God. What do y'all think about that? Do you think that the universe... Do you, think that the, the fact, do you think the universe is contingent, is one question I could ask you. And the second one would be, do you think the fact that it's contingent requires us to postulate a God? Or infer that there is one? What if the universe is eternal? I mean, it still would be contingent. But if it had no beginning, would it still would you still need for there to be a god to create the universe? Yeah. You might have explained this one back up. Just just to be sure. What yeah. exactly does existing contingently? So to exist contingently is just not to be necessary. It's con the way he would put it is you could imagine the contrary being true. So the fact that our universe as a whole exists contingently is like saying you could imagine it's conceivable that the universe does not exist or that some alternative universe exists instead of this one. Sir? Well, if it exists in the then we would conclude that there would be a God because it could change it if you wanted to. And that's true. So you're, you think you're all right with his reasoning here. Yeah. Uh, on the contingency, because uh, I think it, it wouldn't be. It would be because if you if you thought of a different universe, that would it, like I I can't word, word it correctly. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> we might get into something like this. I don't know exactly where you're going, but we might actually have something like this very soon to come up to talk right. about. I can't word it correctly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at his other argument. This is the one based on the principle of contradiction. See, 
in sections 40 to 45. This is very similar. This would be the one that's closer to the ontological argument. Um, this is a really interesting argument. He says there are truths about possibilities. That is, things that could exist but don't. Like, you could imagine that you po it possibly could have been the case that you had another sibling. So if you have brothers and sisters, you can imagine what happens if you had one more brother, one more sister. If you have no brothers and sisters, you can imagine what if your parents had, had another one, right? There are truths about what possibly could be the case. If your parents had another child, would it be a boy or a girl? Would they be fun or would they be annoying? Would they um, do sports or would they do chess club? Or would they be awesome and do both? You know. um, there are possi possibilities that ha could be true. But here's the thing. If there are truths about possibilities, then there must be a necessary being, one whose essence includes existence, in whom those possibilities are grounded. Therefore, there must be a necessary being who grounds truths about possibilities. Otherwise, you would have true beliefs, once again, without anything that makes them true. So when we ask questions like, what would, what would have happened if my parents had another child? Would that child be male or female? There is an answer to that question, but what is it that, that provides the ground of, of, of the grounds for that being true or false? Or, you know, if you say it's a girl, what grounds the fact that that could be a girl? It's not anything that actually exists, so it has to be grounded in something else, something that gives it those truths. And that thing, Leibniz postulates, must be a necessary being, like God. Now, I think this argument is a lot more difficult to grasp. Um, in fact, I think a lot of scholars, including myself, read this over many times and are trying their best to make set heads or tails of, of what this argument is really doing. Um, I've tried my best to portray this as, look, there are truths. These truths require something to ground them, so you have to have something that grounds them. I think you could argue against this in two ways. You could argue that there really are no truths about possibilities. Maybe if you say, you know, there is no truth of the matter. If my parents were to have a child, that it would be male or female, and say, which one's true? I'd say, neither one. I mean, that's just nonsense. That, that, there's a, that doesn't really, we don't want to really say those are true claims or false claims. The other thing you could argue is that they do have truth values, but what gives them their truth values is something besides God. I think this is the part of the argument that I have the hardest time wrapping my head around, which is, so why is it the case that if there are those truths about possibilities, why does that have to be grounded in a necessary being? I think that if I could understand this claim, that I would, that would really help me understand. Like, that's what I'm missing about Leibniz, at least on this point. I think I might be with you in the sense that it confuses me that there would need to be a necessary being instead of there could be truths about possibilities, but why does there need to be a being behind those truths? There at least needs to be something that actually exists, I think is what he wants to say. So it can't just be a possible being, it needs to be an actual being. Now the question might be, well, is why does the actual being have to be a necessary being? You could say because these possibilities are always true, um, so, if it's, so if it's possible that I could have had a brother, it's not just true now, it's true 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, a million years ago. So, you know, that might be part of the motive. You need a necessary being to ground it so it's like always true. Um, let's move on, because this is some of the more interesting stuff. So now... Leibniz, yes. I have a question. Um, Go for it. Are there, does Leibniz believe that, what he believe, does, did he believe that anything that was possible, like everything was possible to know, 
because it's kind of the sense that I got from that previous argument, that there wasn't any information out there that would, was not attainable or understandable by humans. I think that he has a very high view of human nature. I don't know if he would want to say that we could know everything, but he certainly thinks we can know a lot for a reason. Um, we at least we may not have all the information to draw the right deductions, but we've got the right principles to do so. Because when he talks about the possibilities, it's like he can say that okay, well, you can take any possibility, and he says he kind of says that some being necessarily has to know the truth behind this. That seems like a very strong kind of leap to me, and I guess mm -hmm. I just don't understand exactly how that how that plays. That's I think almost exactly my very problem with it. I don't really get that move either. <laughs> if I could help you on that, I would love to. <laughs> um, so Leibniz describes this world as the best of all possible worlds. You could not make this world any better. And in fact, there could be no other world that is better than the one that we currently inhabit. So if you think that the world would be just a little bit better, if there was like, you know, a, a vase of flowers on this desk, Leibniz says that's impossible. Either there's no possible way there could actually be a vase of flowers on here, or by doing that it would actually make the world a worse place in some larger reasons. So there's a reason for everything. It, it, there has to be, because the principle of sufficient reason says... Yeah. Everything must have a sufficient reason. And if God is the architect of this world, then everything that takes place in this world has some... Re God has some reason for it being that way. So, think... There are... A, at least It seems like there are an infinite number of worlds God could have created. Because there are worlds where there are is one human being in it, a world with two human beings, a world with three human beings, a different world with four, five, six... I, that's just human beings, right? We could do this forever. You know, world with one planet, world with two planets, world with three planets. Um, God could have made an infinite number of different worlds. Why did God create this one out of all the ones he could have made? Leibniz says God must have a sufficient reason for choosing to make the world this way rather than any of the infinite number of other ways that he could have done it. For that reason, Leibniz gets committed with the principle of sufficient reason now to saying that this world has to be the best. Because if this is not the best of all possible worlds, and either God was, was stupid or evil in choosing to make this world, because he just didn't realize he was making the worst, this world that wasn't the best, or he didn't want to make the best, that would be bad, or God was... Um, or God is not all-powerful. Maybe he wanted to make the best of all possible worlds. He knew this was the best of all possible worlds, but he just didn't have the, the ability. But since God, of course, is omnipotent and omniscient and perfectly good in his moral nature, it follows that God must create the best of all possible worlds. God could not do anything else. If he did, he wouldn't be God. He would, it would require him to have some deficiency in his character. Yeah? So you kind of answered what I was getting at. It falls back on that same principle that Descartes fell back on that. Well, God is all perfect, so he must have made the most perfect thing. Um, because I don't see how any of the other argument, like, his reasoning could be like, I didn't want to make the best possible world for people who live in, I wanted to give you flaws and Mm -hmm. Like poisonous spiders and, mm -hmm. and things that you know really serve no purpose to you, you know, seem to be perfect in any other way. That it, it, everything seems to fall back on that one principle that not that the being has to be perfect, so it must make everything that is perfect. That's right. You got to really eat that one up to. Yeah, okay. And how could a perfect being choose to do anything less than the best, right? Uh, yeah. And maybe he made an infinite number of possibilities, and we just happen to be in this one. So, that's one thing, actually, there's a philosopher named Tim O'Connor uh, who published a book with this idea recently, uh, which I'm sure you've read and got that from. No. <laughs> that uh, O'Connor thinks that one, of the, one thing people generally say, first, it's incoherent to think there is a best world. Sort of like saying the tallest human being 
the tallest possible human being. Is there a tallest possible human? No, because for any height you imagine, there's always somebody that can be just like a half inch taller, right? So the very idea of there being the tallest possible being or the tallest possible human doesn't make sense. The best of all possible worlds, they would say, doesn't make sense either because you could always make the world just a little better. And as long as you can always make the world just a little better, there is no best of them all. Well, this guy, O'Connor, says, well, that doesn't, that doesn't stop God from creating an infinite number of good worlds. So God doesn't create the bad worlds, but he creates all the infinite series of worlds that are on balance more good than evil. And so he would say you're not committed to saying God creates the best, but just that God creates all of the good worlds. So you're committed to an infinite number of worlds, but at least it gets you off the hook from saying this is the best one. Um, Leibniz thinks that there has to be a singular best world, because if God didn't, if th there was no singular best world, God just, he thinks, wouldn't create anything. God would do nothing. And since we're here and we exist, and we have to believe that God created this world on his philosophy, and that God doesn't do things without good reason, you have to think, this world is the best of all possible worlds. Um, he wrote a whole book dedicated to this. It's called Theodicy, and he kind of references every now and then in this book as well. Um, in the, this bigger work of Theodicy, he defends the idea that this world, the way he defends it is you can't prove that this world is not the best of all possible worlds. For all we know, this is the best of all possible worlds. Um, so, you might be looking at our world and thinking, are you serious, dude? I mean, have you seen what happens in our world? How can you say this is the best of all possible worlds? Part of the, his answer to this is that this is a beautiful world, that it exhibits exquisite amount of attention to detail when it comes to how all the parts come together to create this harmonious, and beautiful and elegant system. Not just in the sense of like when you see sunsets and you know you see you know a, a whale you know jumping in the ocean or something. You go, oh, that's gorgeous. It's <laughs> more in the sense of like the beauty and the harmony of these monads. That once again, since nothing ca actually causally interacts with one another, I mean it's. You look at the world and all the parts and all these monads all doing their thing. I mean, just that is this beautiful picture, this harmonious whole. <clears throat> and that these monads, he says, every single one is unique. There are no two, so if you remember way back to the first reading, no two things in the universe are alike. Everything is has its own unique nature, which means given the infinite number of different things that make up this world, this world also expresses all the different kinds of reality, all the different kinds of natures that could possibly be expressed. And so God, once again, has made this world, not, not just in the way that we look at good and evil, but just in the quality of this world as a created thing, that this is the best of all possible worlds. Sometimes... The way to think about his approach to evil, I talk about this some in my intro to philosophy classes, which some of you have had, is that you should think about good and evil more in terms of like mosaic artwork. So in mosaic art, it's made up by creating like a big picture, a big work of art, out of fragmentary, broken, ugly pieces that otherwise you would just discard in the trash shards. Now, what makes mosaic art very interesting is that it takes these ugly, broken pieces that would otherwise be regarded as trash and arranges them in a way to create a bigger picture that is beautiful and elegant and amazing. Well, Leibniz says that's part of also what makes this world the best. That God could have created the world where everybody per is perfect morally. Like, there, no evil is conducted, we all get along perfectly, and nothing bad ever takes place. But he's kind of, in my own way of putting it, any, any old god could do that. I mean, 
to create a world where goodness comes out of creatures whose nature is to always do good? Come on. You know what a real God would do? A good a God who's up for a challenge to show his wisdom and ingenuity and cunning? He would create a world where good comes out of evil. He would create a world where the evil that, that is committed by the little creatures in there produces an overall good that outshines the evil. And that is what he thinks this world is. That this world, while there is evil in it, God uses evil to produce good. And it's the using of evil to produce good that makes it um, that makes it the best of all possible worlds as well. In a good in a good novel, like in a good book, you want there to be these conflicts and problems that hopefully get resolved in a good way. It's, you know what would be a really terrible book to write or to read? would be one where all the characters just get along and are happy. I mean, a 500-page book where everybody it just gets along and is happy is boring. It's bad literature. A really good book would be one where you have children forced against their will to fight to the death in an arena. And then one of those children from like the poorest district, you know, rises up to be a champion and uh, ultimately overthrows the oppressive government. Now that is a cool story. <laughs> that's the kind of thing that that's the kind of intuition. It's not the exact thing that he's thinking, but that's the kind of thing Leibniz is getting at here. Is that a this is the best world insofar as it's the kind of world that, uh, that God is able to use evil to accomplish good ends. He could have used good, end, good things to accomplish good ends, but it's more interesting, it's more clever to use evil to do that. You might worry a little bit about God and free, uh, God's free will at this point. This is what I thought you might be talking about. I don't know if it no. is. <laughs> that if God has to create what is the best of all possible worlds, if he has to do what he has good, what, uh, if he has to have a sufficient reason for why he creates things, then God couldn't have created a different world than this one, could he? On Leibniz's philosophy, God is God must create this world. Now, here's where it gets even weirder. If God necessarily exists, and God must create this world, then guess what? Then you and this world couldn't be any... Like, there's no other way things could be than having this world exist. So if God must exist, and he must create this world, then this world also, it follows, must exist. Um, any questions about this part of Leibniz's philosophy? Because we're going to keep moving on here from the best of all possible worlds. Then the next section or series of things we get into talk about his theory of pre-established harmony. Um, once again, this is sort of re going over one the ideas we've already covered in a way. Um, so he says that the soul follows its own principles, driven to final causes through its appetite. The body <coughs> operates according to physical laws. We call these efficient causes. And he says that bodies act as if there are no souls, and souls act as if there are no bodies. However, there is perfect harmony between these two realms. And we've touched on this already, that your body would still do what it does even if there wasn't a soul, and your soul would do whatever it does even if there was no body. It's just that God has arranged this universe such that your body and soul you know, dance in harmony with one another without interacting. Um, the very last part of the book he introduces this idea of the city of God. And he describes God as the perfect architect and the perfect monarch. And with God being the perfect architect is supposed to illustrate his design of the universe. This harmony we've been talking about, the orderliness of the universe. 
And the other aspect of this is God's perfect justice. That the wicked are punished and the noble are rewarded, and this, of course, involves an afterlife. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that is shocking is this thing that he says about God. God only is good in relation to the city of God. So that God considered all by himself is not good or bad. Um, and this is another reason why he thinks God must create a world, because God needs to be, by his nature, he needs to be good. So in order to be good, God has to create something so that he can be good towards it, and once he does, if he doesn't do that, he's, he's not a good being. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people might really get worried about this, because it seems now there's this concern in theology that do you really think that God, does God need us for anything? According to a lot of this, God, in some sense, does need us. If God doesn't create us, he can't be good. So he needs us in order for him to be good to us. Yeah? But if he, if he didn't create us, then he wouldn't have to be good for us. He wouldn't, but you might worry. He would say that God being a perfect being, part of being perfect, has, you have to be good. So if he didn't create us, God couldn't be God. <laughs> um, and this, the book ends this isn't the very last line of the whole book but this is in that last section and this is a nice way once again to try to think about this world being the best of all possible worlds he says if we could understand the order of the universe well enough we would find that it surpasses all the wishes of the wisest and that it is impossible to make it better than it is. So he thinks that if we really knew everything there was to know about this universe, about the way the world is, we couldn't imagine it being any better. That God has optimized this world to the best it could po any world could possibly be. And that our inability to see that is really more of, an in of our inability to understand all the workings of the universe. But if you could understand the whole universe in, in its entirety, you would agree, God made this world the best it could possibly be. Have any of you all read a book in one of your, maybe in one of your other classes by Voltaire called Candide, or heard of it? Candide lived about the same time as Leibniz, just a little later. I'm sorry, uh, Voltaire lived a little bit uh, around the same time. In Candide, you can look it up and read it online if you like. Um, there's a character in there named Dr. Pangloss. Pangloss sort of means like sort of um, skipping over everything. Dr. Pangloss is constantly saying in this book, this is the best of all possible worlds. And what Voltaire has happening is like he ends up getting like mangled and dismembered and abused and, and through the whole thing, Dr. Pangloss just keeps saying, well, this is the best of all possible worlds. And Voltaire was very explicitly making fun of Leibniz's philosophy here. If Leibniz thought that since if there is a God, then he'd have to create the best of all possible worlds. And since there is a God, this must be the best of all possible worlds. Voltaire thought if there is a God, then this must be the best of all possible worlds. This is not the best of all possible worlds, so there must not be a God. So, this does give us an interesting thing to think about, which is, do you think God is required to create the best of all possible worlds? And secondly, do you think this, this world is it? And it seems like you've got to come to terms with, if you believe in God, you've got to come to terms with, with, with those claims. Otherwise, I think Voltaire wins the day. Um, when I look around... I don't see this as being the best of all possible worlds. Um, in summary, all that it, so this is the big picture view of Leibniz. All that exists in the universe is composed of these monads, or immaterial souls, these true unities. We had a bunch of different names for these. Or atoms of substance. 
No two things in the universe actually causally interact with one another, um, but they are, they are driven by their internal principles to act. Our perception of the material world consists of these true appearances, of these sort of well-ordered dreams, he likens these to even like the reality of a rainbow. Rainbows aren't real, but there's a sense in which you can say they're real. Like, if, you know, I tell my two-year-old, look, there's a rainbow over there. I'm not lying to her. Um, but there's another sense in which rainbows aren't out there. Um, he believes the universe has this perfect harmony among the parts that allows for the appearance of causal interaction <laughs> without any real interaction. And the principle of contradiction and the principle of sufficient reason, they enable us to know truths of reason and truths of fact, facts, uh, respectively. Any questions about what Leibniz is doing in this? Like, and sometimes it's helpful to just be like, now, what, seriously, how would he explain this? Or what on earth does he have to say about that? Or does he really believe such and such is the case? Like, this is a very strange philosophy in a lot of ways, and I don't mind people asking those questions. Why does he feel that, <coughs> like, we... He, it kind of almost seems like he's putting the existence of God on us. Like, he, like it seems like he has a very extremely high opinion of humanity, uh, so much <coughs> to the extent that, like, this has to be the best of all possible worlds. Like, there could be like other worlds out there yeah. that God could have created that could be better. Like why why are we like the why is it if it's not us then it doesn't exist? Because we don't know about it? Well one of the things to think about um let me see if I can find I'm not going to be able to find the passage. One of the things that he says is that there's sort of an infinite number of, of like worlds as we look at each almost as we look at each organized thing. So humans are <coughs> an important and good part of the created world, but we're not really even necessarily the center of it or the most important part. So he thinks that it's almost like each each thing has it leads to an infinite number of other worlds. Um, it's like... Um, Y'all familiar with Horton Hears a Who? Mm -hmm. So in Horton Hears a Who, he, you know, it's like there's this whole other world on a spec. Leibniz is almost suggesting at times that that's the way our world is. Like, we are one world, and a, you know an infinite number of monads make up this water bottle, which might mean that, the, that there are there's like a whole series of other worlds that just in this water bottle. And we might just be also a world within another set of worlds or something like that as well. So it doesn't necessarily imply um, that... It doesn't necessarily imply that we are the, the best, like we are the most important thing in the world, just that we're part of this world that is the best as a whole system. We're one part in that. Okay, I think I see what you mean. Like we're, we're a part in the most yeah. important world, even though there's other worlds within this world. Yeah. That's what he says. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't call them other worlds. That was my... my right, yeah, but like that kind of yeah. concept. Yeah. Um... So when an action it, like is done, you, did you say universes can be created like split apart, or more a world can be created like is there a world where I pick up Zach's water bottle and then there's a world where I don't? That when we talk when we talk about possible worlds, other possible worlds don't actually exist. Only the actual world exists. There's, still truth. there's a truth about another possible world, but that world doesn't actually exist. So God. God grounds the truths of these other worlds, but they don't have to exist like this world does. Um, let's go.
get started with our last reading for today. This takes us to the little book. Um, we'll be reading, her name is Damaris Cudworth, and then she married a lord, so she became Lady Masham. She was a contemporary of Leibniz and John Locke, who we'll be reading next. Those of you that have the, uh, that are doing the presentation next week, there's a little bit of intertwining in her life and John Locke's life as well, which is interesting. Um, her father is Ralph Cudworth. Ralph Cudworth it was held the, the position of being Master of Christ College in Cambridge. Um, I put up here that he is an important philosopher in the group known as the Cambridge Platonists. Calling him important is an understatement. He is arguably, before, prior to Locke, the most important British philosopher, period. Um, he is a big deal. He has many leather-bound books that smell of mahogany. <laughs> People know him. Um, he is a Im very important individual. Um, we don't know much about her education, but one thing that was definitely important was that she had access to her father's library. When you think about our access to books and information today, we forget <laughs> that there was a time when it was really hard to get a hold of certain books and information. And the fact that her dad was the big dude at Cambridge was really helpful. Um, so she had resources. We know that she learned French, and she was not taught Greek or Latin, but she learned Latin when she got older. And in fact, I think she learned it from John Locke. Um, we know that she learned French because of the very correspondence that we have that we read for this week, she wrote in English, and Leibniz wrote in French. And nobody had translated them. So Leibniz could read English, we know, and she can read French. Um, in 1685, she married Sir Francis Masham. He was a widower with eight children who was a wealthy landowner. So, good news, you got money. Bad news, you're picking up eight kids. Um, she does bear a son, her only, nat her only natural born child of hers. Um, and that takes place shortly after the marriage. She met John Locke at the age of 23. This is in 1682. Remember, she got married in 1685. Um, she appears to have had a very romantic interest in him. Um, and then he moved away to Holland in 1683. Um, the group that's presenting next week may tell us why. The, when he moves away, they actually exchanged love poems and signed them with uh, you know, fake names. It was... You know, I, I, didn't, I tried to find some of these to show you, but I couldn't find any. I thought it'd be interesting to see what philosophers write as love poems. Um, later in life, in 1691, he moves into her estate and tutors her son. Um, and he stays there until he dies. And when he dies, he gives away half of his inheritance to her son, because he has no children. He never marries. I was looking as hard as I could to see if there's any connection. Could this son secretly be John Locke's son? But I think I've been watching too many soap operas. I couldn't find it. <laughs> so, probably not. Um, she also has this correspondence with Leibniz. And interestingly, Leibniz <laughs> initiates the conversation with her. That Leibniz does not um, assume that, um, or li like she doesn't reach out to him, he comes to her. So that's really nice, actually, because women were not highly regarded, especially in academics at this time. Um, some people wonder if Leibniz had ulterior motives. Did Leibniz really care about her opinion, or was he trying to get in touch with, you know, John Locke in some way? Or was he just trying to, you know, she, because of her, of her father, was it really about her father more than about her? She does write some philosophical books. Um, they were both uh, published anonymously, but the interesting thing was they were both attributed to Locke. Now, Locke is no small deal either. He's 
after, um, I would say, uh, in the history of British philosophy, he's probably the best, the greatest, the most well-known. For people to think that her writings were his is a very big compliment, I would say, to her. So she is, um, she's a very good philosopher. She did also write a, a biography of Locke, and she may have written some other things as well. And um, actually, this second book I have up here um, is re uh, is actually related. Actually, I think they both are. They're related to a controversy that she has with another of the women philosopher, another one of the women philosophers that we read out of here. And I'll mention that when we get there. Um, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and take another break and let's try to be back when this clock says 7.30 and then we will pick up with the text of Lady Masham.